again, the broadest possible outline of Galatians is this three-point thing. Uh, he's defending his authority as an apostle, he defends his message, and then he applies that to their lives. And this is the week we move on from number one to number two. And so, just a little review. We won't go through the whole history of Paul's life leading up to this point. You can go through the old PowerPoints for that. Long story short, he takes the first missionary journey, plants these uh, Galatian churches, and he returns back to his home base of Antioch. And then Peter goes to visit Paul up in Antioch to see all the great things he's doing. He's, he's supportive of it, hanging out with the Gentiles, eating with them, spending time with them, until these very conservative Jews come from Jerusalem. And they go up, and when Peter about hanging out with the Gentiles all over again. And he starts raising up these separations between them and others. Paul confronts Peter about this. It doesn't seem to go well because Paul does not tell us how that ends. Uh, so it doesn't... I assume that if Peter was like, oh yeah, you're right, my bad, just really quickly, then Paul would have said, and even Peter said that I was right, he was wrong. But he doesn't. So there may have been some real conflict. So they head down to Jerusalem around this time to have what's called the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15 to hash out some of these things. And along the way, or around this time, Paul learns that those churches that he had just planted in Galatia, another faction of those same conservative Jews had gone, oh, sorry, conservative Jewish Christians, they are Christians, Jewish Christians, had gone back to those churches that he had just planted to tell them that what Paul had preached to them was an incomplete gospel, that they had the fuller picture of what it's what's supposed to be happening. Um, oh, yeah. It's, it's around this time. Okay. Paul's been defending his authority. He does this by telling his own story of how Jesus knocked him off his horse and commissioned him to be an apostle and a preacher to the Gentiles. He's, he challenges these conservative Jewish Christians that have come to the Galatians. They've come with a message did their message come from Jesus? Because mine came from Jesus, Paul says. He talks about how he privately met with Jerusalem leaders, and they didn't bring up any issues with what he was preaching. Um, and he did not seek nor need their approval, but they gave it to him nonetheless. I this outline that I found really helpful. Um, it's a little dense, but um, the, what we've been going through is the broad introduction of the whole letter, like the first main section of the whole letter. And the main point that Paul's trying to get across, if you desert the gospel he's been preaching, you've pretty much been deserting the gospel itself. Um, he gives a, a greeting that subtly kind of implies his own authority, that is recognized by others, and um, he explains the problem, that they are so easily being swayed away from the gospel he preached. He goes on to say that his gospel is derived from God, not human beings. Jesus had told him that. And um, his thesis is that Jesus is the one that gave him this. And he gives a few supports that we've been going through over the past few weeks. He talks about how he used to be really hostile against Christians, but God called him. And then he wasn't that big of a deal in Judea, and yet he was still doing these amazing things. And his message was, he wasn't causing all these issues. It didn't cause such a big stir when he was giving this new message because it fit in line with what the Spirit was doing. Um, and we're in those broad category support. Then the last two, these were chapter two last week. The pillars of the church, James and Cephas and other Jerusalem leaders, they had recognized Paul's authority in his work in Antioch. He told, and um, Paul goes on to say that his rebuke of Peter, that of all the people out there, he rebuked Peter himself. He says, this shows that I have the authority to speak a gospel message that you can trust. Chapter 2, last week, he tells two different stories before he transitions to the theological stuff we'll talk about tonight. His first story, so after 14 years of ministry, ministry he visited Jerusalem. And again, they didn't bring up any issues with it. They rejoiced with what he was doing. There wasn't any problems raised. Second story is that he said he went to go see what Paul was doing in Antioch. And talk about all that. Sorry about it. Okay. That's where we've been. Any questions about the letter so far? Okay. Which letter is 
The there are two most scholars there are two different timelines of when they get inflations away from rhythm. Um, with the one that I'm putting forward in this Bible study, that would make Galatians the very first letter written. And maybe probably the very first writing of the New Testament written. Um, if you go by the other timeline, that would make uh, First Thessalonians the first letter, um, and it would push this back to maybe to like the third or fourth letter. But either way, early, either way, before any of the Gospels were written, um, and all that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and no. So, so because I don't know, I didn't, so you think this is the first? Um, chapter 3, he goes from defending his own apostleship, his own authority, to explaining and defending the message he sent to them in the first place. Uh, he talks about the spirit in this first section. They tasted this. They've experienced this. How can they just move away from it so quickly? Um, I, I, I broke, doing this PowerPoint this week, I broke the rules of PowerPoint. You're not supposed to put like everything you're going to say, like, um, but I did. Uh, yeah, so he goes on to talk about Abraham a lot, as we've already seen tonight. There's a lot of Abraham and his seed in this uh, chapter. And part of that is Paul stressing that this whole plan out of which Paul's own message comes out is plan A. It was the plan all along. It was the story that God had in mind for the universe. And he says to go back to the law is actually to move us backwards in the history of what God is doing in the world. And God's ultimate purpose, as this chapter talks about, is to create one new family of humanity for the good of the cosmos. To go back to that kind of outline, we've now moved in from a big, broad introduction to the second part, where he defends his gospel with an appeal to their experience by the receiving of the Spirit, by faith, not by works, appealing to Scripture, and then from the history of salvation itself. Uh, what you were talking about in our group, Rosalind, the priority of the Abrahamic covenant and how the Mosaic one so. Okay. So the Matt would be here for this. Uh, come on, Matt. Okay, this is where we go. The usual story of Galatians. If you grew up in American Christianity, if you heard a sermon on Galatians, this was probably what you heard. Legalists have come to Galatia. Paul was preaching that people got salvation by faith through grace. And these legalists came in preaching a works-based salvation. That, and Paul, his argument back to them is, you aren't made righteous, justified, and saved by works, but by faith. It says, faith in Jesus gives you needed righteousness for heaven. And when you trust in Jesus, you become justified, forgiven, get Jesus' righteousness because he fulfilled the law. And so we get that so we can go to heaven. And these people that keep wanting to have you do these works of the law in order to be saved and go to heaven are preaching a false gospel. Does that sound familiar to anybody? There. Okay. That stuff, the theological parts of that, points of that are true. That is not what Paul is talking about here. Um, and if we try to fit this, fit Galatians into this sort of scheme, it actually does a lot of injustice to what Paul's trying to say, trying to talk about. Uh, and so let's go through some of the 
background? What's in the mind of Paul and the story that he's working out of as he writes chapter 3 of Galatians? First, we're going to do some reading. Um, can someone get Genesis 12, 1 to 3? Takers. Okay. And then uh, those references of 15, 1 through 6, and 12 to 18. Uh, you take that. Okay, Matt. Okay, so. Yeah, go to the Lord said to Abram, go to the country, the people of Kabbalah's house. Sorry, wait, wait. Everyone's flipping. Sorry, I shouldn't have gone so fast. This is important. Okay. Now. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country with your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who will bless you, and for the persons you have in Christ. And all people on earth will be blessed through you. Okay. And 15, those sections? Yeah. <clears throat> After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, afraid Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless, and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is in your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. And he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. 12 or 18. Mm -hmm. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. And the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for four hundred years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking firepot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants I give this land, from the wadi of Egypt to the great river of Euphrates. And then a bunch of ites. Yeah, I was glad. Yeah. <laughs> I I am going to have us jumping around like splitting up some of these longer texts. Um, you just got to trust me that if you read the whole thing, it would still say what I'm trying to say it says. Um, that I just, for sake of time, splitting it up. Um, so if you go through that first instance of God calling Abraham, it's in Genesis 12. Genesis 3 through 11 is the story of how the first sin starts eating its way into every part of the fabric of the world. Uh, you get... Uh, you get the Garden of Eden, and the fruit, and the serpent, and you get Cain and Abel, and then you get uh, you get a mixture of the children of God having sex with the, with the children of man, and uh, creating these weird big creatures called the Nephilim, and it's all this unnatural mixing of, of things that were meant to be divided, and all this weird mysterious stuff people argue about. Uh, today, then you get the flood happening, trying to wipe everything out, and then even after that, uh, Noah's children are continuing to fall into sin and curse, and then there's the Tower of Babel that happens, and you have whole societies that are then divided by God because of their own pride and arrogance, saying, "We will let's make our name great," and He scatters them and confuses them. In the next chapter, chapter 12 opens up with God finding Abram and saying, I will make your name great. That we see the verse 3 through 11, or chapters 3 through 11, that 
sin, this wickedness, this brokenness, this fracture of the world has spread into every part of human existence. And so then chapter 12 comes and Paul uh, and God sets in motion his plan to fix it. God's single plan through Abraham's family, Israel, to heal the world. This is the covenant, the promise, the one plan of God through all of history to heal the world, its people, and the cosmos, and its societies by creating one new family through Abraham's family, Israel. Okay, um, if we can flip over to Deuteronomy 29. In the course of time, this, uh, these people, Israel, receive a law from one of their leaders, Moses. And this law is a way of trying to steward the covenant people, to keep them on track, if you will. As Paul puts it to... Um, to guard them and to keep them. But this this promise, this, this law comes with a series of blessings and curses. Blessings if you follow it, curses if you break it. And the whole section of chapter 27 through 29 are these blessings and curses, depending on how they respond. Uh, I'm sorry, chapters 27 to 29 of Deuteronomy are talking about the blessings and curses that come with the law. So, can somebody read Deuteronomy 29, 24 through chapter 30, verse 7? Actually, I can do it. Four. Um, he's talking about how if you fail at following your side of the this law. Uh, all these curses will come, destruction will come to your people. Also, so all these surrounding nations are going to look at you and say, whoa, it does not look like God is on their side. Uh, and those nations, verse 24 picks up, and they and indeed all the nations will wonder, why has the Lord done this to this land? What caused this great display of anger? And they will conclude, it is because they abandoned the covenant of the Lord, the God of their ancestors, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. They turned and served other gods, worshiping them, gods whom they had not known and whom he had not allotted to them. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against this land, bringing on it every curse written in this book. The Lord uprooted them from their land in anger, fury, and great wrath, and cast them into another land, as is now the case. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the revealed things belong to us and to our children forever to observe all the words of the law. When all these things have happened to you, the blessings and the curses that I have set before you, if you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you and return to the Lord your God, and you and your children obey him with all your heart and with all your soul, just as I am commanding you today, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you, gathering you again from all the peoples among whom the Lord your God has scattered you. Even if you were exiled to the ends of the world, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you back. The Lord your God will bring you into the land that your ancestors possessed, and you will possess it. He will make you more prosperous and numerous than your ancestors. Moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul in order that you might live. The Lord your God will put all these curses on your enemies and on the adversaries who took advantage of you. Israel ended up failing its responsibilities to the covenant and the law. And so those curses fell on them, and they were taken into exile. I told you this last week. This is still true. The Jews believed they were still in this story. They were caught in that space between 
in a sense, chapter 29 and chapter 30. They had failed, and even though they were technically allowed to come back to the land of Israel, they were still under the rule of foreign powers, being juggled around from empire to empire. That it wasn't with the full dignity, the full blessings that God had promised them in chapters 27 and 28 of Deuteronomy. And so they still felt like, to a certain extent, they were in exile. What would deliver them? It had to be God himself. So all the Jewish people were longing for God to act on their behalf because he was their God and they were his people. And they still felt this sense of exile culturally at the time. Contemporary to, to Paul and Jesus in those times. So the basis of the deliverance that they're expecting. I really want somebody to read this. This is a beautiful beautiful passage. And it's very important for this. And by the way, in Romans chapter 10, this chapter 30 of Deuteronomy that we just read, Paul, in a much longer version of the argument he makes in chapter 3 of Galatians, in Romans, the way he makes the same argument is by unpacking Deuteronomy chapter 30, what we just read. So this is in Paul's mind when he talks about these sorts of things. Um, so, let's see. Daniel 9, this is while they are in exile. This is, this is, Daniel is a Jew that had been carted off into Babylon, and he is at the service of the Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar. And so this is from the place of exile, after they had failed the covenant. And this is what he says. And just, will somebody read 3 through 19 for us?
So we cannot present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and act. Do not delay your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. Okay. Does that sound like a legalist? Does he think his deliverance is going to come, or the deliverance of God's people is going to come on the basis of what, of the good things that they do? So let me ask you this, where do you think we've ever got the idea that Judaism felt like you got into the people of God by way of the works of the law. Who are the Ten Commandments given to? Who gave them to whom? No. <laughs> when Moses received the Ten Commandments, who did he then turn and give those to? The Jews. The Jews. With the Ten Commandments, how somebody became a Jew? See, here's the, the big thing. The, at the time, the, the entire faith of Judaism, even through the time of Jesus and Paul, was a faith that was longing for God to act on their behalf. And here's the thing we miss, and it's all over the Old Testament. Judaism was a faith of grace, a religion of grace. These works of the law are given to people that are already God's people. They were not the way you got in. And this is a, a key thing about the ancient world. I said last week that rather than like an up-down separation between heaven and earth, the mindset of first century Judaism was more on a timeline between this age and the age to come. And so, oh wait, let's see. Yeah. The main question was not how do you get saved? That question would not have made sense to a Jew. They're not wondering about salvation as if some heaven or afterlife sort of thing. They're talking about deliverance for God's people here and now, for the covenant to be vindicated, for their trust in God to actually be shown to be true, that they've made a big bet on this God and his covenant. And they've spent a long time not experiencing the blessings that he said he could offer them with his covenant. And so they want vindication. They want their faith and their confidence and their hope and their trust to be justified in the end. And that has nothing to do with salvation, the afterlife, heaven, hell, any of that stuff. The question was, what is God's purpose for Israel? Would God be faithful? When? How? And when he is, who gets the benefit of that? Just Jews? The rest of the nations? Like I said last week, they knew that in the age to come, there'd be a great, all, all the nations of the world would come to worship Israel's God. They were anticipating that. And so as I said last week, the question that they had that, that Paul's arguing about is not how does one get saved, but in a sense, in the history of God's work in the world, what time is it? Is it the age to come yet? Or is it still the old age? Throughout the Old Testament, you see that the way somebody became a Jew was simply by birth. For the most part, to be part of the people of God is something that you were born into. You didn't have to obey some things. You didn't have to do a bunch of works. 
You have to follow this law. And heck, there's not even a belief that you had to be perfect in the law. Because there's the whole sacrificial system to, to deal with that. When Moses got the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, he has the Ten Commandments in one hand, but in that same speech, God also gives Moses the instructions to the tabernacle where the sacrifices were made once they mess up the Ten Commandments. He anticipates they're going to screw this thing up, and he gives them a way to still maintain a relationship with them. So this whole faith, the works of the law, were not how you became part of the people of God, but how you lived in response to being the people of God. It was their badge of, of identity, their ethnic marker. Usually when we say works of the law, in a biblical sense, what comes to your mind? I think it's what a lot of us have thought. But if you look through the Old Testament, and and actually there's very few writings at the time that Galatians was written, there aren't that many other Jewish writings at the time that use this phrase, works of the law, that Paul uses. But each time they do, first off, they're referring to what nowadays we call Torah, the, the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament that really do map out God's intention for how he wants his people live and act in the world. And so Torah was Israel's badge of identity in contrast to the surrounding people. And so there was a belief. They're still in exile. And as Daniel prays, longing for some degree of faithfulness to Torah, to come to Israel's people, for them to come back to their God so that God will be faithful to the covenant and deliver them. Ultimately, not because, of, that they, because they have done that, but because of who he is and the covenant and the promise he has made. And so they do not think that the law was something that made you part of the people of God or got you into heaven but rather it was the stuff you did now in the present that was an evidence and a response to who God is so that in the future your faith and trust in God will be vindicated that you'll be shown to be in the right How God's people were supposed to act after they were already in by the grace and mercy and love of God. It's not about legalism. It's not about salvation. It's about how one acts as the people of God separate from those that are not the people of God. Now, we have some translational issues here. The word justification uh, in, in the original language, it's the same word as righteous. Well, there, what we tend to do is we end up using words like right and righteous for sometimes we translate it in words like justice and just and justification we translate it other times, but they're all the same family of words. They're all the same word. And so um, you have different people that want to be consistent. They'll either jump to, they'll try to put everything with a, like a just prefix, like justification to, as an act of justice to show that God is just as an act of justness. Or you can do it the root the right, that God is in the right to declare you righteous. 
the righteousness of God. And so uh, it's, a, it's a legal term, a law court term. This word justification, this root word. And a lot of the complications in American Christianity is that it's the same, it means righteous. Justification in the Greek, it means righteous, but what about righteousness? It actually, more, most literally, it would be righteous by, if we were to turn it into a verb. Um, so how do you, what does it mean to righteous by? And some interpreters, like, especially since Reformation, took that to mean, it must mean that when you are justified, it means that God makes you righteous. There's an actual change in your being and your soul that you are therefore righteous. But in a law court, that's not what that means. It means you're vindicated. It means you're, you're found to be in the right. You might not actually be, but it's just the declaration of the court. You've been vindicated. You're found to be righteous, but it's a legal declaration over you. It doesn't change who you are. And... Um, and so you see throughout this idea of righteousness, the righteousness of God throughout the Old Testament, and some of the stuff we've read tonight, is not that God does good things, but his righteousness flows out of his faithfulness to his covenant. So whenever the Bible talks about God, you are righteous, it's always in an appeal to how God is being faithful to what he has promised before, that he's in line with his own character and his own nature and what he has said before. And he is consistent and faithful in that. And that's what it means to be righteous. And so righteousness is covenant faithfulness. We'll get to Galatians here in a second. Also, most of the times that Paul uses the word justification, it's in the future tense. Not in the present. A few times it is. In the sense in which we are declared righteous and justified now. But what that means... If you think back to what the Jews were hoping for with the works of the law, what that means is to be justified now is that your faith and trust in God and his promises will be vindicated. You are justified in that faith. Because at the end of everything, when you stand before the ultimate judge and the ultimate law court, you will be declared to be in the right. That you have chosen correctly. Not that you have earned a bunch of goodness, not even that you have wrapped yourself in Jesus' own goodness, or that he's given you his goodness. But apart from any of that, you've been declared righteous because you're joined to the righteous one, Jesus. Another translation issue. Whenever it says faith in Jesus, the little translation that is faith of Jesus. What does that mean? Uh, it can mean it's your faith in Jesus. It could also mean the faith of Jesus that belongs to Jesus, his faithfulness. And if you look at this idea of righteousness being covenant faithfulness, what if you read all those things that said you're saved by faith in Jesus and instead it's saying you're saved by the faithfulness of Jesus. It's not you having to figure out like how to have more faith. But that the faithfulness of Jesus to God's promises in the world have saved us. It can be either the faithfulness of Jesus. And this is the key thing. If you read in Daniel, he knew that the way that Israel would do their part of the covenant to show that they were God's people, that would be vindicated by God's gracious action, they, he knew that they would do that if they, were, if they themselves exhibited covenant faithfulness. But the law and Israel's failure in following the law in their covenant task shows that they will never be the faithful Israel that they need to be. And so Jesus actually comes. And the faithfulness of Jesus is Jesus being 
representative of Israel. Instead of there being um, Israel being faithful, you have a faithful Israelite in Jesus who stands in the place of Israel to be faithful where they have failed. And so when it talks about Jesus being faithful or righteous, it's not that he did good things. It's that he had in mind the covenant and the promise of God. He was faithful to it. Um, a writer that talks a lot about this is N.T. Wright. And he has uh, chapter 2, verse 16. He has a little, uh, his own translation of it that incorporates all these ideas. Um, that I really love. He says, we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through the faithfulness of Jesus the Messiah. So we came to believe in the Messiah, Jesus, so that we may be justified by the faithfulness of the Messiah and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no flesh can be justified. What do we see? These are three things that justification is about. Yeah? That was a lot of them. I know, I know. Okay. Um, so were you saying that wherever it says faith in Jesus, we should be inserting faith on the Jesus. Yes. Great. <laughs> so, all that to say, these are the three dimensions of what justification is. First off, that anagogical thing earlier we talked about, those ideas about the future, the world to come, it's about that, the future. Justification declares that the new world, God's new world, the age to come, has begun. There is a degree to which we have been justified now, declared to be in the right. And there is also a future justification. We stand before the judge. He will declare fully we are God's people and we belong to him. It's about the covenant. Justification says that God's promise to Abraham that we read about in Galatians 3 has been fulfilled. He has come through. That longing of the Jewish people to know, is God going to fulfill his promises? And how? This idea of Paul's idea of justification is declaring that God has been faithful in Jesus. And it's about the law. That Jesus, in his resurrection, is the justified one. His faith and trust in God the Father was vindicated. It was justified. He was found to be in the right. And that's the same sort of justification that waits for us at the end of all things in our own resurrection. That we'll be found to be in the right as we are joined to Jesus and his faithfulness. It is not working. I don't know why that's not going back. Wow, I can only go forward? That's weird. That's right. It's all right. How can justification be justified? Well, that's what, that's what Paul, Paul explains that in chapter 3. And we're, we're actually going to go into chapter 3 right now with these ideas and apply it there. And we'll see what Paul says about that. It actually becomes 
I put these ideas kind of swimming around our heads, then we'll look at chapter three and hopefully it'll make sense. Because the, the, my, the, next, the natural question to what was on your previous slide to me is that, like, so who are the children? Who are, we look at it this way, like where mm -hmm. it's the vindication of mm -hmm. Christ, that yeah. who are Christ's children that are then vindicated if it's, you know, is that everyone? It's the covenant that expands that you mentioned. That's exactly what Paul's arguing in chapter three. So let's So if we can have Galatians 3 in front of us, this is the home stretch. Um, okay. First off, I want to start, go back a little bit to chapter 2 that we ended last week here. That's the beginning of Paul's speech to Peter. 14 and 21 is the whole speech to Peter that he gives him in Antioch, starting his argument. And if you look at in that section, when it says works of law, what Paul means is living like a Jew, taking on this ethnic marker of separation between you and other people. Paul goes on to say there are two reasons why the law doesn't justify. First, um, Jesus' faithfulness redefined into one people, and the law only separates people. It designates who's in and who's out, who is God's people and who's not. It's not the way you get in, but it's the way you, how you mark yourself that you are in. And so the law can't justify us. The law can't make us righteous and join us to Jesus because it's all it does is actually separates us from other people, first off, and it exposes sin. It doesn't resolve it can't do anything to actually address sin. And so, Paul, in one last verse, he says, the truth of the gospel, it means confronting Peter, that not eating with Gentiles attacks the truth of the gospel, because this idea of reconciliation between these two people is actually inherently the idea of God's covenant all along. The one plan, the one story of God. And so, as he goes on to say, raise up what I tore down, I'm, I'm, I show myself to be a transgressor. What he's saying there, in essence, is the Torah, it only separates people and condemns them to reveal their sin. And so if you're going to go back towards these ethnic markers that divide you from other people to make you seem different and better as God's own people, then all you do is you put up a big sign that says, you're a sinner, you're a transgressor, that's all the law can do. Oh, I said that. When Paul says that he died to the law, so that he could be joined to Christ, he's talking about himself as a Jew. Under Torah, they all died to the law. Just like, and that includes Jesus. Jesus, under the weight of the law, became a curse under the law. So that in his resurrection, he could pave the way for our rising. So the law, in a sense, we die, well, the Jewish people, the law kills them. It only condemns them, shows how they've fallen short of the covenant. And so Jesus takes on those curses of Deuteronomy that we read earlier on himself and shows a way out the other side. So, into three, chapter three. The first thing he just, like I said earlier, he talks about, you received the Spirit. You saw the how effectual my preaching was and the gospel that you believed. Miracles were happening. People were, like, coming together. with uh, Apart from all these works of the law, apart from these ethnic markers, 
And that wasn't good enough for you? The Spirit. Now, from verse 6 all the way to the end of the chapter, there's a lot of Abraham. And if you look in verse 6, 6 and 7, it talks about those who believe are the descendants of Abraham. And if you go to the last verse of the chapter, and if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So this whole section, the rest of the chapter is bookended by this statement about those that are joined to Christ are joined to the covenant that came before the law. Is that it? it kind of points to what you were talking about earlier. And who is counted as children. And sometimes, some people can read this and think that Paul's just being like, you just need to like trust in God, then he makes you pure and forgives you and you can be saved. And hey, I know a good example of that. That Abraham guy, he did that too. So you should just be like Abraham. He's not an example. He's actually part of the argument, part of our story. We flow out of the promise that was given to Abraham. We're the culmination of God's covenant with him. We are. Abraham's not just a nice example, but if that Abraham stuff didn't happen, Jesus would not have come, and we would not be God's people. And the story of redemption goes from Abraham to the law to the Messiah. It's a progression of these things. And so, what Peter was doing by going back to the law, is actually going backwards in history, backwards in the work of God in the world. And so what Paul goes on to say through this first section of chapter 3 is that the, the law is a problem because there's the promise, the covenant made to Abraham that through his family, the rest of the world would be made right. But the law gets in the way of that. three ways that cover the next three sections. First, the law cursed Israel. It came with blessings and curses, and they failed. So it cursed them. Um, which is, and that's why it says Jesus himself became a curse for us. That he faced those Deuteronomy curses that we read about, and he overpowered them. And so the question here, when you say, oh, why did Jesus become a curse for us? It's not so he could just free us from sin so we can be saved. According to Paul, the answer is so that the blessing might come to the Gentiles and fulfill the promise of God, to bring the promised spirit to his people. Those are the things that are in Paul's mind, not this idea of heaven and hell and, and judgment and all this afterlife stuff. He's talking about here and now. The second problem, the law divides this new human family. That's what it was supposed to do. It was supposed to mark out who God's people were. And so if you go back to the law, you end up separating what Jesus is trying to bring together. When it talks about how there's, actually, I love the NIV, where my version says, um, where is it? once a person's will has been ratified, as if someone's will for after they die, but the sense here, the word here is for covenant. He's talking about once the covenant is ratified, no one can add to or annul it. Now, the offspring seed idea we're talking about, some of you touched this in the analytical section, that refers to them as Messiah. But as Paul goes on to say, those that are joined to the Messiah in baptism become the people of God. And so that seed, that offspring, is all of us joined to our representative, who is Jesus. So, 15 to 18. Yeah, so his point is that the promise came before the law. Go back to the law, you're actually getting in the way of the promise. 
In 1922, the last problem with law is that it imprisons us in sin. Law cannot bring life, only death. And the law actually kept Israel from fulfilling its part of the covenant. And so Jesus becomes the faithful Israelite that can bear the curses of faithless Israel and then can take on himself the blessing and bring the blessing of a faithful Israelite into the world to fulfill the law and its blessings and curses so that the promise might come that had been promised all along. We are not plan B. And so Abraham's true family is not defined by the law. Faith is now our badge of honor, not these works of the law that divide us from others, not these ethnic markers. He goes on to say that, I like how N.T. Wright puts it, that some of our translations said different things about what the law did for us. He calls it, it was almost like a babysitter for Israel. Because all those problems with the law and how it actually got in the way of the promise happening to bring these people together, you could start thinking, oh man, the law kind of sucks. But Paul says, no, it is a profoundly good thing because it actually restrained and it kept Israel on track to be a people, to be God's own people, and to create the context through which the Messiah would come. Without the law, without that sense of separation, without that, that stewardship, that babysitting of God's people for a time, then the whole thing may have fallen apart enough that the Messiah never came. And so the law served the purpose of bringing forward the Messiah so that the covenant can be fulfilled. It's all been a part of the Yeah, one way of putting this argument is that before the Messiah came, we were in darkness. It was nighttime in the world. And the Torah was like a candle that kind of lit the way for us. But now the Messiah has come. It is daylight. The dawn has broken on the new age. It's Paul's argument. And yet whenever Peter wants to raise up Torah and the works of the law against Gentiles, even by something as small as not sitting with them. He's actually pulling people back into darkness, pulling people backwards to define themselves by something that actually prevents the covenant from becoming true in our lives and in the world. For Peter and Galatia to go back to law-based markers is to go back in the dark. We are inheritors of Abraham's promise, and the whole time, it was talking about and pointing towards us in this new age to come in God's new world. There's no division in the family. And another, you know how we can, where was his faith in Jesus? You can substitute faithfulness of Jesus there. Whenever it says righteousness or justification, when you get home, like, go back through this chapter and instead put marks of membership within God's family. And it will make so much sense that the marks of membership in God's family come from the faithfulness of the Messiah to fulfill the promise of God, to take on the to become a curse under the law, so that He might bring us the blessings of the law. So the summary of the whole chapter. The law put all of God's people under sin so that on the basis of the faithfulness of Jesus the Messiah, that Abraham promise might be given to all of us who believe, both Jew and Gentile.